Hey everyone, welcome to Garden Fork Radio. This is a little different than normal. It's Eric solo show, mobile version. How's that? I've got my uh, Zoom H1 microphone. Oh, there's a bird over here making this kind of chirping sound. And I wonder if I could get closer and share this with you. So this is kind of nature Garden Fork Radio. Let's see, I'm gonna be very quiet. Okay, that didn't work too well, did it? Well, long story short, in the front yard, up at the cabin here, there was a downy woodpecker whacking away at one of the trees. I think they established territory that way, in addition to looking for food. And there were two smaller birds. They looked sparrows or finches, perhaps, but not like an English sparrow, which, oh, there it goes. Um, they were dive bombing the woodpecker. I was like, that's pretty ballsy, you know? So maybe they have a nest nearby because there are, they are, it looks like a pair and they are, the woodpecker is long gone and they're just kind of hanging out near this birch tree. So I wonder, birch trees are a soft wood and they can have, there's a, there's a birch in the back that has a woodpecker nest in it. And I'm wondering if this might be a cavity nest as well that, I don't see anything. Anyway, um, I'm on my second version of the... Oh, hello, everyone. If you this is your first time, this is a little unusual for Garden Fork Radio. Usually we're, uh, you know, with the computer and we have a guest and we're talking about interesting topics. And this week I thought, you know, it's all about use what you got with me. And hey, let's try this and see what happens. And so I'm trying this. I'm running around the yard with my mobile microphone, which I really like. Uh, it's a Zoom H1. If you're thinking about starting a podcast and the two, you one or two of you, oh, the little bird is in the lawn now. It's a great mic. I will link to it in the notes, the show notes here, which you can just tap on. You tap on the Garden Fork, the show story details, and there'll be a, a clickable link. It's an affiliate link. That's how we pay the bills here. Anyway, that little bird just flitted off again while I'm yakking here. Um, it is strange just talking into the microphone because sometimes if I do this in New York City, people are like, what's that guy doing, you know, <laughs> at least in Brooklyn, in Manhattan, it's the people don't really don't care. But anyway, hey, here we are. Welcome. Thanks for thanks for downloading the show. I appreciate you taking the time to check us out. I've been talking more about the podcast and our YouTube videos, so I don't know if that helps. I don't really look at the stats a lot. Every couple of months I look at the stats. There's about if you're interested, there's about twelve hundred people listen to the show every week which is pretty darn cool. I mean, you might not think that's a very big number, but imagine being in an auditorium speaking to 1,200 people. That's a pretty big number. I'm, I'm, I'm always impressed. And I love the emails, radio at gardenfork.tv. I'm going to talk about some comments we've got recently here in a minute. I'm going to walk over to the side yard here, and this is version 2.0 of our No Need Bread in a Weber Grill. I don't know if you've watched last week's YouTube video, but I tried to, I tried being the uh, operative word there, make no need bread in a Weber grill. Because my thinking was, you know, I want to make bread in the middle of summer, but I don't want to womp up the oven in the kitchen because that it heats up the whole house. I have a, not a range hood, it's a vent in the wall, you know, to, to vent out the hot air, but it doesn't, it doesn't pull all the hot air out. And, and the oven is this big heat source that takes hours to cool off so you've got that fan white noise going so you're heating up a house that you actually want to keep cool and I thought well could you make an oven out of the Weber grill and I think if you had all the right stuff yeah but you know being being Eric I don't have everything the um, Weber grill I have is a smaller one I think it's a 22 inch and I found it on the street in Brooklyn it's called the street find someone was moving you'd be surprised when people move out of an apartment the stuff that they will just leave on the sidewalk because they're sick of moving or they don't have a space for it in their new place and i got this grill and it's like so i lugged it up here to the little house and uh it works just fine but the idea is can i make that into an oven and if you watch the first video 
Well, it was a learning experience. That's a polite word for it. That's what I'd call that. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, the bottom of it was burnt and the top was baked perfectly. So some really good comments, which I'm going to read here about how to improve that. And then we can talk a little bit about I'm still I haven't even started baking the bread. I'm preheating the Dutch oven right now. So um, I, I thought, you know, maybe I'll maybe I'll do my podcast while I'm waiting for that to heat. So we're outside. I've got the iPad sitting here on the wellhead. Henry and Charlie are in the yard. Uh, the deer flies aren't too bad right now. Somebody's dinging me. Um, so let's go here. So from last week's No Need Bread, a couple of actually really positive comments, a couple of negative ones, but let's talk about the positive ones from Lisa V. My husband's a grill master and I'm an experienced bread baker. So together we have developed a method of baking bread successfully on a Weber grill. My husband started the calls just as you did, but he arranged them in a circle below the grate to create an indirect heat, a method he uses when roasting turkey on the grill. I centered a deep dish pizza stone on the grate, but not over the coals and let it preheat 450 to 475 degrees when hot enough I slid the bread onto the stone, put the lid on the grill, and squirted. When hot enough, I slid the bread onto the stone, put the lid on the grill, and squirted a little water through the vent holes to create steam. The bread came out great. I have a couple photos, but I can't attach them here. Oh, maybe I could, I could message Lisa and ask her to send us photos. Somebody asked, and they always do, where is your recipe for no-need bread? And I guess it's, a, it's an attention span thing, but throughout... It's, couple times in the video I said uh, at the end of the video would be a link for the video about the no knead bread recipe but then people always ask anyway so I just politely reply with the link to that video it's also on the garden fork site just go to gardenfork.tv and type in no knead bread but I have it well actually I now measure it using a scale but if you want to do it by volume it's three cups of flour one and five eighths cups of warm water, a heaping teaspoon, a heaping one eighth of a teaspoon of uh, active yeast, and then a heaping teaspoon of salt, kosher salt, cooking salt, not table salt. You would use less with table salt. And there you go. You just mix together the dry ingredients, the yeast and the salt and the flour, mix that all together. I use a whisk actually, and then add in the water. It's going to be real shaggy. You don't want a real wet dough. You want it to be half dry, half wet. Cover that in a warm place overnight, and that's your no-knead bread uh, dough. All right, so from Steve, I would leave the wire rack in and put the cast iron elevated if the cover fits. Oh, it'd elevate the Dutch oven a little higher if the uh, Weber grill cover fits. Double dome effect should work. Same amount of coals. Great idea, though. You should make a t-shirt, got wampin'. I think that, I don't know if that's a new word for me or just using it in the videos now, but wamping hot, um, that means it's hot to me. And I guess uh, people have called that a, a new word. The impatient gardener, Aaron. I wouldn't call that a failure. I'd call, I'd cut that top off and enjoy it, which we did. Butter, glass of red wine, or a fruity IPA, depending on who you are. And um, this is here. Your parchment is based on the oven in the house. You may want to cut a type of disc for the bottom. I don't know what that means. Oh, but several people suggested to check out Cowboy Kent Rollins' YouTube videos on cooking and baking in cast iron over coals. So that's Cowboy Kent Rollins. Go to YouTube and type in Cowboy Kent Rollins. It's kind of neat, you know? Yeah, it's just, it's sure enough, there's, and that was from David. Thank you, David. And um, this one, I got a couple of these. Eric, you made me seasick too quick with the camera. Much better when the boss takes over. Cheers for now. Well, the boss isn't always here. Um, she works about eight days a week, and then uh, she has her own alone time, which I really can't infringe on. I got to, you know, just kind of recoup. And a lot of times I'm kind of talking to the camera, but also showing, an, you know, something going on. 
And with the grill, I can't really get my head right next to the grill because it's too hot. So I was, I was whipping the camera maybe a little too fast back and forth. So, you know, what the heck. James, James G, regular contributor. That was, that was brilliant. Not for, not for you, the confident, let's see what it tastes like at the end of the cooking session. And of course, it tastes divine. You're a human and have interesting and useful results. Negative results are as important as the other kind. Thanks. I totally agree. Veronica posted, I can't wait for the follow-up video. Yeah, well, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, Snow Pony, regular uh, person. Okay, so it wasn't perfect, but it was done. <laughs> I'm sure your next attempt will be more successful. Love the GF philosophy and your approach to more things. Looking forward to the next video. Yeah, so that was kind of cool. I went to the nursery this morning. There's a there's a working farm. It, they have grass-fed milk cows. It's called the Freund Farm. It is in Canaan, Connecticut. They have I think it's a complete it is a completely closed waste system there. They take their manure, they run some of it through a methane biodigester which they heat all the buildings on their property with. And I've, see, I've gotten a tour of this thing. It's pretty cool. And then they take a lot of manure, and they're also now trucking in manure from the neighboring farms, and they make what are called cow pots. These are degradable nursery plant pots. I wonder if you've heard of them. Aaron from The Impatient Gardener, have you heard of these? Are you talking back to your podcast player right now? I bet you are. But um. So they have this nursery and they sell these cow pots and they also sell a lot of seedlings. They have a greenhouse. It's just, it's kind of amazing. It's a working farm and they figured out how to make it all work together. And they, they work about nine days a week, um, like the camera operator. But they were having, uh, they have vegetable plants that are kind of looking kind of dreary and spent and they were free. And they had some cardoon. And I don't know if you've ever seen Cardoon, the plant. I saw it at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden in the Herb Garden years ago, and I've always wanted to grow it. It's a member of the artichoke family, and it looks like this spiny plant you'd see in Latin America. Maybe like a mashup between an aloe vera plant and a cactus or something. It looks a little prehistoric but it has these beautiful white gray leaves that are kind of spiky, spiny. And they're used, actually, I think in Italian cooking. I could be wrong about that. Someone will fact check me, please. Radio at gardenfork.tv. But I got four of them because they were giving them away. And I have one raised bed dedicated to flowers, which my, my neighbor gave me dahlia tubers this year. So those are in there, but there's still some room. And I'm going to throw the cardoon in the front of this thing. And I think that's going to look really cool. What do you all think? Have you ever grown cardoon? I would like to hear from you. What can I do with it? What can I cook with it? Let me know. Radio at gardenfork.tv. They also had potatoes. Potato. I've never seen someone sell potatoes that have been started already. And these are about two foot tall. But they were in a big cow pot. And I'm going to dig a deep hole in my garden uh, on two, two big holes and drop them in. I already hilled uh, the potatoes I planted from seed potato, but I'm going to put these in as well. Because um, my friend Alex, who is an excellent chef, is big on potatoes. And I thought growing him fresh potatoes would be kind of a, a thank you for all the cooking he does, because he cooks whenever we get together, he and I will cook together. And I learn a lot from him. So I thought, I'm going to grow him potatoes. And uh, in the fall, we'll have some nice potato dishes. I've also been uh, experimenting with uh, a real basic curry dish, which I should make a video about. I don't know. I'm not an expert at curry, but it it should it can be very complicated. Yet I think it also can be very simple. I I I mean, basically, what I've done is I have uh, curry powder. Wave to the neighbor curry powder, and then garam masala. And both of those are spice blends of basic spices. Because, you know, you see the photos for a, a curry in a cookbook or something, and they have all the spices on a beautiful, like, tin plate or something. And it, there's like 11 spices there. And you're like, oh, I got to go to the store and buy 11 spices. 
but the garam masala and the curry powder are blends and curry powder among curry purists is controversial. Maybe that'd be the polite word for that. So I take those, I take, I'm cooked down, I mince some onions pretty fine, garlic, and then when those are starting to go clear and starting to get a little golden, I throw in a big tablespoon of curry powder and a big tablespoon of garam masala, neither of which are spicy hot. Um, then not, there's not, I don't think there's any red pepper flake in them. And I'm a real gringo when it comes to spice hot kind of thing. And I look, I let the oil and the heat from that, does it really toast the spices? It, but the oil gets infused with that and warms the spices. And you're, you're not really dry toasting it. You're wet toasting it, I guess would be the word for that. Anyway, so I, I start that and then I throw in the heaviest not the heaviest, the vegetables that take the longest to cook. Carrots. I mean, a kind of classic curry that my uh, friend Alex makes is carrots and potatoes a lot of times. So I put in the carrots, I chop them in the, you know, like size of nickels or whatever, throw that in, let that cook, throw in potatoes. And then I just go through the freezer and the fridge and see what I have, you know, like chickpeas, I love chickpeas. I always have some chickpeas from the uh, Instant Pot. There's a video about that, of course. And, um, and let that cook. And then you throw in a can of, um, what's it called? I'm blanking. Uh, I buy the Goya version. Um, is it coconut milk? Is that what it's called? Hold on. Coconut, coconut. I'm walking into the house because uh, my brain doesn't always work and I know exactly where this can. But I'm real visual, I don't always know the names of things, but I know what they are, um, what the jar looks like going through the coconut milk. Ding, 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 ding. Leche de coco, by the way, in Espanol. But coconut milk, when you open that can, there is um, oil at the top, it's a solid oil. So uh, it's like a vegetable shortening, I guess. And that is what's going to give your curry a mouthfeel, which I think is important. If you're concerned about the caloric rating, you can get a light version of it or just womp off, womp off, here we go, that would cut off half of the solids, set that aside for something else and use that. But I, that gives it a creamy mouthfeel. And also you gotta realize that one can of coconut milk is serving four or five people or you know, th two or three of your meals if you're, if you're making a big thing and you're gonna take it to work or something. And that's it. And then uh, I just, I, I salt it. I put some salt in at the beginning with the onions and then I'll salt it. Well, I'm gonna taste it and salt it and then I let it cook down. And boom, you're done. Uh, I, don't, I don't stick blend the vegetables. I like the vegetables to be whole. At the very end, if I have frozen corn or if I keep frozen corn or frozen peas in the, in the freezer, cause I, you can buy them in bulk at the Costco. It's like a two pound bag, maybe more organic. Uh, I mean, I eat them. I just eat them out of the freezer. So that, those go in and then cilantro at the very end, fresh cilantro, I think is important. If you're not big on that, there's some people actually don't like it and that's totally okay. <laughs> don't yell at me. And then boom, you're done. So, I'm gonna walk over to the Weber grill and see. I'm having some issues with ventilation because the, the, the vents at the bottom of my grill are broken. That is um, still heating. And I can hold my hand over it for about five seconds of the vents that are coming out the top here. So um, I should really tend to this thing. I've been yakking here for a while. I'm gonna set up the tripod, put the dough in here close up the Dutch oven and close up the Weber. I'm going to add a few more charcoal. I'm learning about, um, you know, you can start it with a small amount of charcoal that you got to the, the hot, you know, where it turns gray. Put that in your Dutch, not your, put it that in your Weber grill and then add some more raw briquettes, fresh briquettes. What's the word? Un briquettes that haven't caught on fire yet? You'll tell me, I'm blank. I get those, so those are touching the charred, glowing briquettes, and those will slowly start to burn as well. So you're kind of creating a sustained temperature, indirect heat. Um, I think I have an inverted 
cake pan, a nine, nine by nine, kind of like a brownie pan in there. And that's going to keep the Dutch oven away from the coals. It's all about, hey, let's try this and see what happens. That's, that's life, isn't it? So let me know your thoughts. It's radio at gardenfork.tv. And if you want to sign up for our email list, there's a link below. Or just go to gardenfork.tv slash news. Gardenfork.tv slash news. And you get Eric in your inbox every week if that's something you want. Plus, there's a Labrador picture in every email with the knuckleheads here. All right, go out and do cool things. Let me know about it. I'll see you.